Hi, welcome to our session on the history of medical testing in Oregon and the nation. I'm here with my co-host Mireya, and we are going to walk you through this module today. So my name is Rebecca Arce. I am the Service Equity Manager for Aging and People with Disabilities at the Oregon Department of Human Services. I'm housed in our Office of Equity and Multicultural Services. And Mireya? Hello, my name is Mireya Williams, and I also am a service equity manager for the self-sufficiency programs with the Oregon Department of Human Services. Thank you. And as you can see, we're also joined by Elizabeth today. Um, she will not be participating in our conversation, but she is helping us out with our captioning. So as you watch this from home and you're in need of captioning, that's what Elizabeth has helped us with. So um, we're going to jump into our module. And start sharing my screen with you. And you're watching this because you will be going into our long-term care facilities and testing not only the residents, but our staff. And it's important to know how healthcare systems, communities of color, people with disabilities, our LGBTQIA plus individuals and veterans have a history of mistrust with government testing. Although you are a contractor, because this is an executive order by our, gov our governor, you may be seen or perceived as government. So in this module, our hope is that you'll understand why it's important to know this history of testing so you can help our staff and residents um, feel like they're honored and trusted in this process and that you could also develop that basis of trust by applying what you learned here to the testing process. I wish I could ask you questions, but um, because we are doing this online, I've asked Maria to join us so that we could have more of a dialogue if, as if we were in person together. So we'll all be learning together today. So this mistrust is rooted in eugenics. And while Charles Darwin's doctrine of survival of the fittest was not rooted in eugenics, um, the idea of creating a better citizen came from the idea of survival of the fittest. And in 18th, 17th, 18th centuries, the um, scientists really wanted to speed progress of humanity. And they thought that they could achieve that by creating better citizens. And this meant making sure that, um, and I'm choosing my words carefully here, which is why I'm pausing, making sure that certain populations were contributing to that betterment of society, which the word better is also subjective. So we have to think about who the scientists were then and what they thought would be better. Medea, can you walk us through the legacy of testing on who we thought it was okay to do these tests on? Yes, thank you, Rebecca. So people of color, immigrants, poor people, women, people with disabilities, people experiencing mental health needs, Holocaust survivors, veterans, LGBTQIA plus individuals are all a legacy of medical testing, have a legacy of medical testing. Many of our policies, decisions are made based on who is deserving of public benefits and who is undeserving. Through our own social constructs, our public policy has conveyed the message that people of color, immigrants, poor people, and unmarried mothers are un unserving, under, un Serving, serving of public benefits. Sorry, I'm having a difficult time with that word today. And access to equitable health care. Furthermore, while our, our society may view people with disabilities and mental health needs are viewed as de des des deserving, <laughs> they are not often in positions of power to make decisions for themselves. Many decisions about health care are made for them all. All these factors play into the many, the history of medical testing and how the folks living in long-term care facilities may 
view governmental health workers coming into the test into test them for COVID-19. So it is really important that we establish a relationship and that we build trust with these communities given the history that they hold. In addition to our own American construct around public policy, some of our older American or adults lived through the Holocaust where medical experience, experiments were performed on Jewish, Roma, LGBTQ individuals and people with disabilities. There are over 100 Holocaust survivors living in the Portland area. Their unique experiences and those of veterans may contribute to distrust, fear, PTSD when it comes to government testing. And this is why it is important for us to understand going into these environments and with our communities. Thank you. You're welcome. And if we remember, one of our first outbreaks in a long-term care facility was actually in one of our veterans' homes. So I want to make sure that we start there as well. So um, we know why there might be some fear for these communities. Um, some examples of this history of medical testing, again, we're going back on who is deserving and who is undeserving, who is respected and who is not respected in some of these decision-making policies. Um, the study of modern gynecology was actually performed on enslaved Black women, and the doctor would go in and pay for the usage of time for these enslaved women, not give them anesthesia, and perform multiple surgeries on them until he perfected the art. Some of the women underwent 20 to 30 surgeries. And then moving forward, we had the Tuskegee experiment where, again, African-American men, it was supposed to be part of a six-month study to study syphilis. It ended up going for 40 years. Even after they found a treatment for syphilis, the members of this experiment were not given access to the treatment. Um, they were also not told up front what the study would entail. They didn't tell them it was about syphilis and they infected some of them. So this happened between um, a 40 year span. And moving forward again, um, so we're moving from the 1800s into the 1900s and even up until the 1960s, 70s and 80s, there, were, there was forced sterilization of Latinx American Indian and African American women and people with disabilities because they um, had negative connotations attached to them. One was assimilation, one was immigration, and one was just that people in mental hospitals or in prisons that were seeking public benefits as well, so unmarried women, they were all subject to forced sterilization, either to be released from prison or the mental hospital or to get access to public benefits. So I just want that to kind of resonate for a moment. These were folks that um, might've been put on a path due to the nature of just the group that they were born into, and then to seek help or to seek a better life, they had to give up their right to become parents, which can be a very beautiful, life-changing thing for many folks. And if we think about the way we frame our society around family, we had taken them out of that equation. And some of this is within living memory. Um, forced sterilization happened in Oregon up until 1982. And there's some further reading here. Um, so up in this century, there were at least 148 California inmates, women that were forcibly sterilized up until 2010. Um, there is also an in-depth history, the second article, if you want to dig into it, about, as it says, the ugly past of U.S. human experiments. 
these are some things that we don't talk about because it is shameful part of our past. And I know that you're in the medical industry because you want to help folks. And I, a lot of this can bring up shame for individuals as well. So this isn't about shaming individuals or the system. It's about knowing how we can improve what we do and come to a holistic worldview of what has happened. So if we think about folks that are in long-term care facilities now, they may be in their 70s or their 80s, and this happened in their lifetime. And even if it did not happen to them, it has happened to their loved ones. LGBTQIA plus individuals, I'm gonna go back one slide. LGBTQ plus IA individuals, they were seen as someone with a mental health disorder up into the 1980s and just based on their sexual orientation could be put in a mental hospital. And upon release, they would have to go through one of these procedures. Those are folks that could be living in our long-term care facility now, facilities now. And the same for unmarried women who are also seen as in the, and you'll see in the article, sexual deviants because they were unmarried and that they were already mothers. It's just the way that our society has viewed people again as deserving or undeserving or what is right and what is wrong. So I hope when you go into these facilities and you work um, through the testing process, if you notice they're hesitant, maybe just think about some of the things that we're talking about here today. I'm going to have us watch two videos. As you can see, this one is called No Mas Bebes. These are voices of survivors. This is just the trailer for the movie. This is an hour-long video available from OPB Independent Lens, and it talks about the forced sterilization of women who were under duress or actually sedated when they signed consent forms for this. So when they woke up from surgery, they found out that they were sterilized or they found out years later. Give me just one moment while I set this up for you. And captioning is available. Acá tenían camas todavía, mira. Y yo por dentro sí siento mucho tristeza. Volver recordar el, lo que eh, sientes. Pues ¿Y por explica. qué sientes tristeza volver? Pues, ¿sabes? Mira, pero te tengo necesita. tristeza. Sí. Uh -huh. This baby boy became a citizen one minute ago. His mother does not have immigration papers. We're told they should be sterilized to save taxpayers' welfare. Something drastic must be done about population growth. The doctor walked in and said, we cut your tubes, and I said, why? He goes, well, you signed for it. I said, me? I go, I don't remember nothing. And I didn't tell my family. I didn't tell anybody. They were extremely fearful being told that you need an emergency cesarean section and you can feel blood pouring down your leg. At that time, signing a consent for a tubal ligation. This is the emergency department of Los Angeles County, USC Medical Center. Some of them signed right in the midst of labor. Some of them don't even remember signing. 
here I is, this young lawyer, and for the first time telling him, do you know that you've been sterilized? We are suing HEW for non-compliance or non-enforcement, non-monitoring of the uh, sterilization regulation. It was just the beginning of the emergence of the civil rights movement in the Latino community. We were talking about abortion rights, all of the issues of feminism at that time. The idea that somebody could be forcibly sterilized, like seem like something out of a mental institution out of the 1920s. The claim that we're part of a greater goal of sterilizing the Mexican population that immigrates to Los Angeles. I mean, I'm offended by that. That's not what we did. The way I felt when I was young, it doesn't change the way I feel in my heart now that I'm older. But it, it's there all the time. It's like when you bury somebody, you're always going to carry it on your head. encourage you if you are curious about that to go ahead and watch the full video oh excuse me it was still playing in the background on my end um, so again the full video is available through OPB independent lens available online and if we look at the woman that was interviewed this was in within our lifetime and I believe it was in 2002 that our governor, John Kitzhopper, offered an apology for all of the 2,000 plus sterilizations that happened in Oregon. What are your thoughts on the video, Mireya? I just uh, was thinking about, uh, I was born at the uh, USC Medical Center in 1972 and it's interesting to think about what my mom's experience could have been in that situation as an immigrant um, also and so it was very it's very powerful to me and interesting to see and I can only imagine what she could have gone through. Right. It, Thank it's you, also Richard. the reason that we're in this job as well and and wanting to ensure that we're caring and sensitive and and this is why we're doing this this training yes thank you um i still get chills when i watch this one being from southern california being from an immigrant family as well and having a fear of going in for medical procedure that's routine um, should have been accessible for everyone and to not know what would happen when you would come out. Yes, absolutely. And I think in, in our community, that's why it's, um, there's that hesitancy of going to the doctor, even just for a checkup, because of all of the, the weight that that carries and just simply thinking about going to the doctor for all of the the reasons that we just mentioned and the, uh, the trauma that we carry with us. Right. Thank you. And then moving to a medical facility like a nursing home or residential care facility, there's also just some life changes and emotions that come with knowing that you need more assistance in your life and having to be very vulnerable with your care providers. Um, and maybe not really being able to explain why that is. And now we're faced with COVID-19 and the coronavirus and having more people come in and ask to take your blood or to, to have a very uncomfortable procedure where someone is sticking a swab in your nose. So if we could sit with that for a moment and kind of know where that might be coming from and get curious and not assume but maybe ask how someone is feeling about what's about to happen if they had any further questions and again i know we're talking to medical professionals who do this regularly but 
just an added thought for the history. Um, it looks like we, I hope we you might be a little frozen, Rebecca. easily fixed and it was a good point to stop <laughs> the dialogue so if you have any other thoughts i'd help you share those and if not we can move into our second video sounds good yeah okay Great. thank you yes thank you our second video is a little bit longer um again this one is not um not Oregon specific, but we mentioned that there were over 100 Holocaust survivors living in Oregon in the Portland area. And um, just maybe thinking about what they might be going through. So let me get this video up on the screen for you and then we'll watch this one together too. Thanks for your patience. There was an ad that I wanted to go through and not have you all hear the ad. And this one is pretty moving as well. There's no sound to it, Rebecca? We got them from the cattle car. People were selected to live or to die. People crying, pushing, shoving, dogs barking, trying to make some sense of that place. And I actually turned around in trying to figure out what is that place. Never seen a place like that before. And as I turned around, I realized that my father and my two older sisters were gone. Never saw them again. We were holding on to mother for dear life. And Nazi was running in the middle of that selection platform, yelling in German, twins, twins. He noticed us and demanded to know if we were twins. And my mother asked, is that good? And the Nazi said, yes. My mother said, yes. At that moment, another Nazi came pulled my mother to the right, we were pulled to the left, we were crying, she was crying. And all I ever remember is seeing my mother's arms stretched out in despair as she was pulled away. I never even said goodbye to her, but I did not understand that this would be the last time that we would see her. And all that took 30 minutes from the time we got down from the cattle car, and my whole family was gone. Only Miriam and I were left holding hands and crying. We were Mangala twins, which we found out later on what that meant. us every morning and he wanted to know how many guinea pigs he had this day. I was used in two types of experiments. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they would put me naked in a room with my twin sister and many other twins up to eight hours a day. 
They would measure every part of my body, compare it to my twin sister, and then compare it to chart. On alternate days, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, they would take us to a blood lab. They would tie both of my arms to restrict the blood flow, take a lot of blood from my left arm, and give me a minimum of five injections in the right arm. The content of those injections, we didn't know then, nor do we know today. After one of those injections, I became very ill with a very high fever. My legs and arms were swollen and very painful. I was trembling as the August sun was burning my skin and I had huge red spots covering my body. The next visit to the blood lab, they didn't tie my arms. Instead of that, measure my fever. And I was immediately taken to the hospital. The hospital was another barrack, but it was filled with people who looked to me more dead than alive. Next morning, Mangala came in with four other doctors, never ever examined me. He looked at my fever chart, and then he declared, too bad, she's so young. She has only two weeks to live. Good and gather. For the following two weeks, I have only one clear memory, crawling on the barrack floor, because I no longer could walk, and crawling to reach a faucet with water at the other end of the barrack. And as I was crawling, I would fade out in and out of consciousness, telling myself, I must survive, I must survive. After two weeks, my fever broke, and I felt immediately a lot stronger. It took me another three weeks before my fever chart showed normal. Miriam, when I got back, she was sitting on the bed, staring into space. When I asked her what happened to you, she said, I cannot talk about it. I will not talk about it. And we didn't talk about Auschwitz until 1985. When I asked her in 85, Miriam, do you remember? When I was taken to the hospital, she said yes. I said, what happened to you while I was in the hospital? She said, I was under Nazi doctor supervision 24 hours a day. It was the same two weeks that Mengele said I would die. So I said to her, what happened to you after the two weeks were up? She said she was taken back to the labs, injected with many injections that made her feel very sick. As we found out years later, when she grew up, got married in Israel, expected her first child, she developed severe kidney infections that did not respond to any antibiotic. Second pregnancy in 63, the infection got so bad that the Israeli doctor studied her and they found out that Miriam's kidneys never grew larger than the size of a 10-year-old child. So I begged Miriam that not to have any more children because every pregnancy was a life crisis. But she had a third child and after the third child was born, her kidneys deteriorated, started to deteriorate and by 1987, they failed. At which time I donated my left kidney. I had two kidneys and one sister, so it was an easy choice. But a year later, she developed cancerous polyps in the bladder. The doctors kept asking me to find our Auschwitz files. We never found our files. We never found out what was injected into our bodies. Miriam died. June 6, 1993. Months after Miriam died, I received a telephone call from a professor at Boston who said he heard me speak and he would like me to go to Boston and speak 
And when I came there, it would be nice if I could bring a Nazi doctor. I was stunned at such a question. And when I thought about it, I remembered that the last project that Miriam and I worked together before she died was 1992. And was a documentary done by a German television about the Mengele twins. And in that documentary, there was a Nazi doctor from Auschwitz. And I figured if he was alive in 92, he might be alive in 93. So I got his telephone number, I called him and invited him to Boston. Where he told me he was not willing to go to Boston, but he was willing to meet with me at his house in Germany. I didn't, didn't plan to ask him any of these questions. Suddenly, I am. Do we have to start over? No, we're good. We're still recording. So the rest of the video goes on to talk about forgiveness between the doctor and um, Ava, which I think is pretty powerful and kind of um, the reason why I chose this video is because as a, I wanted to talk about how we can re regain trust and the forgiveness process too. This documentary is also um, available in the full length of a little bit over an hour on YouTube um, if you would like to watch it. So this one is called I Survived the Holocaust Twins Experiment and I see that um, Frida has joined us. So Frida if you would introduce yourself please that would be lovely. Hi, um, my apology. My name is Frida Bikele. I am the service security manager for HR Center and Shared Services. My apology for joining you guys late. I was wrapping a meeting, so I just got done. It's always lovely to have you, Frida. <laughs> and um, we just watched this video, and I wanted to get some feedback or thoughts when you watch this, Mireya, or I don't know when you joined us, Frida, um, if you saw any of it, and just have a dialogue about this, what they were talking about with the medical experiments. Wow. Um, you know, I, it, it just made me think about, you know, I have twins. I can't imagine being in that situation or either having my children to be pulled away from me in that manner I, it just and then for them to have to suffer through all of the experiments that they went through at such a young age I, I just it's heartbreaking it's to know what environments we're going into and what people's experiences have been and, and just um, being compassionate and empathetic when we're talking with them. Thank you. Frida, did you get to watch any of the video? That's no, I haven't, but I can just go off what Mireya said because I, I've, I've had a long experience dealing with the healthcare system here and I think that goes back to the issue of trust. When did the trust, when did the, the fracture happen? So I think this is what you know has led to us being now, you know, not really trusting with the system and with the medical care, the healthcare system, and even with practitioners. So again, I think I, you know, I kind of have you know that shared experience where I had a really sick child, and you know, the treatment wasn't appropriate. Where I'm now very anxious every time I have to send her off to some kind of you know exam or some some kind of treatment even some kind of medication I now question everything is something I use not to but that comes from the fact that you know the more you interact the more you see things that are happening to your child and the protective mechanism falls in you have to be you have to protect but how much protection can you give so yeah thank you and um I know I said we were going to talk about some organ things and some national things too. And um, this is just a legacy that most folks know about because it was a huge 
event in our world. And we know that over 6 million Jewish, Roma, LGBTQIA+, and people with disabilities were murdered during this, this period. But um, Ava, the woman in the video, she actually lived until um, 2017. And she was still on the road doing um, presentations and discussions about what happened to her. And I think it's just a testament to the human spirit. And like I said, that forgiveness can play a big role into that and regaining trust. So I encourage you to finish watching that video if you're curious. So I'm gonna jump back into our slide deck here. I have a few more things for you to um, just think about, and then we're gonna go into a reflection. Okay, so um, Frida talked about this too. So it's not just testing healthcare and, ac and access to that healthcare is not equitable. And so a few of our populations that will be in our long-term care facilities are returning veterans and our LGBTQIA folks. Um, no, uh, some of our, our veterans were not celebrated when they returned from overseas. And I'm talking specifically about Vietnam. Um, there were some very short periods of war that we had in the Gulf in the 1990s. And there's, in that time, there was a stigma of mental health needs of what it meant to return as a veteran and re-enter into civilian society. Um, we didn't talk a lot about traumatic brain injury as well and the behaviors that come with that. Um, and still today, we know that there is inadequate staffing at facilities. So just because we have a VA doesn't mean that everyone's getting the access to the healthcare they need when they need it. And that can also create distrust in our system. And for LGBTQIA plus individuals, you've heard a lot about the history of eugenics and their role in being part of the mental health population that was deemed undeserving. But also um, in the AIDS and HIV epidemic, which I'm glad Frida's here because she actually worked um, with OHA in the AIDS HIV field. And there was a period of time for a decade when our black and brown LGBTQIA people were not receiving health care. Um, it, there was a stigma tied to AIDS and HIV that prevented them from getting treatment and even studies to find cures. Um, it wasn't until Ryan White, a young man who was of European American descent, actually contracted the virus through a um, blood transfusion, and then the medical research started pouring in to find a cure or at least a treatment that would be life-sustaining. So I just paused there for a moment because I wanted to think about the thousands of lives that were lost in our black and brown communities by being ignored from our system, and then what it took for the U.S. to invest in finding a cure. And um, some anti-discrimination, I'm sorry, some discrimination still exist um, for LGBTQ plus population, specifically, particularly our trans individuals. So it was just this year two weeks ago that we had a ruling that um, LGBTQIA plus individuals cannot be discriminated against in the workplace, but they still don't have those protections in healthcare. Did you want to add anything to that, Frida? Yeah, I, I want to go back to the AIDS HIV. So even though we were able to find a cure and make the cure available to all people, in, again, in Oregon, 50% of newly diagnosed cases are black and brown. We still have not been able to tailor the services based on these groups' cultural need. 
we still have not you know invested enough resources even though the program has over 5 million a year we still are not able to you know the right resources you know to that specific community even though we look at the numbers you know and we have community partners out there who are willing to do the job but it's not just because again we we are living in a system that's deeply rooted you know on racism so racism still in fact the way people brown black and brown are allowed to have to get uh, access to care we even have a case cases where your immigration status should not apply when it comes to accessing HIV and, 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 and AIDS care, but case workers in the field still are asking people to show them for identification, even though the, the law says no, people should have access. So just showing how even now, even though the, 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 pro, the, the program has been out there for a long time now, people don't still don't have access. That's critical. And again, and this 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 disease is greatly impacting a specific community, LGBTQ. And you know, so yeah. Thank you, Frida. And that history of being ignored for so long, it could be generational. And why our black and brown communities still don't want to have access to services or even talk about what's going on because they fear that they will be ignored. And um, I don't know if anyone here has seen Jen Silent or knows about Jen Silent, but it's a whole documentary, documentary series again, how um, folks from this, this LGBTQIA community, how they have to go back into the closet when they enter long-term care. Because the facilities can be welcoming, but sometimes the residents, their fellow neighbors are not as welcoming. And when you're taking a sample from them, it just brings up so many memories. So thank you both for being here. So why are we talking about this history and how does it parallel with what we know about COVID-19 testing? So we brought up a lot of things in our talk today um, and I just wanna break it down here really quick. So it could bring up post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD because they're reliving their experiences of their past, which is causing them to have increased trauma, not specifically by COVID-19, but of everything that reminds them of, of everything the testing reminds them of. They may be in fight or flight. Um, they also may not want to disclose it because of the stigma around mental health and being or having a, institutions involved in their care. Folks might also feel pressured to do this. And so how are we letting them know, especially it's not for the staff, but for the residents especially, how do we let them know that this is voluntary and that there won't be any negative repercussions for declining testing? Again, you're all in the healthcare field and you know this intuitively. Um, we're just adding a new layer for you. Anything you'd like to add, Medea or Frida? Okay, thank you. All right. I, so can, this... I can add something real quick. I want to add, you know, yeah, the previous slide, please. I want to add that, you know, we also have to keep in mind that people don't even have to have lived through these bad experiences. Those stories are passed on to the next generation. So they may be reacting to stories that their communities, their, their people have gone through. So they can also carry those, those trauma with them. So you also have to keep that in mind. It's a very important point. Thank you. The community trauma, the generational trauma. Yes. The stories we tell our next generation. So I just wanted to have some time for us to reflect. And for those of you that are watching this, maybe if you can jot these down or have a dialogue with someone that you trust and have these conversations. So just think about a time in your life when your family member or loved one needed support when undergoing a medical procedure test. So I just want you to think about that for a moment. And what did that loved one need from you? What could you give them in that moment or through the process? And um, what do you wish you could have done to make them feel safe and supported? Or what did you do to make them feel safe and supported? 
So my dad, um, he is an immigrant as well um, from Mexico and he has had a history of strokes um, and I go with him to do, uh, well, I try to go virtually over the phone talk and help my parents through, did we freeze? Okay, did we freeze, we're back? Okay, I try to support my parents through these processes. Um, I know that they can feel overwhelmed because of how many, the history that we've had, but um, I always try to at least make sure that there's medication management. I try to explain the procedure to the best of my understanding to them, and I make sure that when they're discharged, they have everything that they need. Um, in our culture, I'm the youngest daughter, so I do a lot of caretaking for my parents, and I feel honored to do that for them. But that's my culture. What about you, Medea or Frida? Go ahead, Frida, please. So, to be to be honest. Uh, a medical procedure is always the last result. We don't go there first. So when a family member has to go, a loved one has to go, I, I use, I, I tend to not, I tend to use every other option before I, I get to that point. And when I have to do it, I try to find a provider who may, who may look like me because of trust. And I remember delaying my own daughter's surgery because I was interested that the person who was supposed to perform surgery on her at age 10 months will, do, will have her best interest. So I had to delay until I found someone who could. So that's, that's, that's just what I, how I approach those procedures and those tests. Thank you, Frida. Yes. Um, and we may not have so many options for this case since we're trying to do testing through September, but that's important for the folks that are doing the testing to know, how do we ease them into this? How do we gain their trust? Thank you, Frida. Okay, and our next reflection. So how will you approach the testing process in long-term care facilities? And moving forward, how do you think your interactions will change with communities who are undergoing testing? Again, all communities, right? This is a legacy for most folks that are in long-term care facilities. And what approaches will you use to build relationships and establish trust? So um, maybe some tips, since we're not the ones actually going in and doing the testing, we're just here to have this conversation with you. Um, Frida or Maria, how would you like to see this, this testing, if this was one of your loved ones, what would you want for them? Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I think it's important that we really, um, you know, provide our long-term care um, participants, customers with the opportunity to see who they feel comfortable with or to meet with who they feel comfortable with. So maybe identifying a cultural or a linguistic need that is best suited for that individual. Um, and, and then once that is that connection is established to really, again, the compassion, the, you know, sensitivity uh, approach, all of those pieces are so important in ensuring that they understand why we're doing this. Um, and how we're here to support them through this process. Those are just very important um, key elements that we would all want to know. We all want to know what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, and what what is it going to do for me. Thank you. Thank you. Frida? Yeah, to add to what Mireya said, and also listen. We have to listen to concerns, you know, some recommendation, the kind of setting, maybe in my room or in the living room, you know, what other things does the client want for them to feel safe during this process? We have to listen and try, you know, to the best of our abilities to meet those needs before we even engage in this process. 
Thank you. And, you know, um, we, I had mentioned about just being there with my family. And in this case, the loved ones cannot be there with the residents or the staff to walk them through this. This is something that they have to do on their own as we've limited visitation and taken visitation away from many people. So um, what I love about working with Mide and Frida is we know we have business to do. We're always busy, we're always doing things, but we always take a moment just to check in with each other. Where are we at right now? How are we feeling before we dive into what's needed today? And um, I know we're on a deadline to do this work, but I think it would go smoother and um, be more calming if we could just be present in the moment with the folks that are undergoing the testing, offering the linguistic and cultural services that they need. And if um, you are able to just hear, as Frida said, what they really need in that moment. They might not tell you because they don't have the words or they're afraid to, but what does their body language say? What other words are they using to describe their hesitancy? And just try to be present with them. You know, drawing from your own well of empathy can be really tiring, especially um, in the world that we're living in right now because we all are dealing with our own stress. So please support each other and take care of yourself. Um, so that you can acknowledge the experiences and validate the fears and feelings of the staff and the folks that you're working with. And this last one is not just for the staff and residents that we're testing, it's also for you. Respond to yourself and the folks that you interact with with kindness. Give yourself grace to make mistakes. Give yourself grace when you're not feeling present in the moment. Give yourself and others words of encouragement and move at a pace that folks are comfortable with. I know we have a sense of urgency and you being in the field and testing folks creates a sense of safety for many people. And I just thank you so much for doing the job that you are doing for keeping all Oregonians safe. Mede or Frida? Closing yeah, words. In, indeed, thank you all so much for um, taking the time to do this and really um, engage with our communities and um, again build those relationships and be empathetic while we're going out into their environments as well. Thank you. And, and also remember that is a learning process. You know, we all rely on each other to learn through this process and you know and rise. So just just compassion and love and empathy will get us through because again we are working to making oregon a better and safer place for us so just yeah so we all rely on you to to making sure we all get there thank you and rebecca as you said i really want to emphasize the point of taking care of each other as a team and individually uh, because if you aren't taking care of yourselves or you're not taking care of each other, that you're not going to be there for our families who need you and our staff who need you to conduct these trainings.